Do you know why we call Thursday of Holy Week Maundy Thursday? The origin of the phrase goes all the way back to the events leading up to Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. While in Jerusalem to observe Passover, Jesus gathered his disciples and washed their feet, teaching the disciples and all of us to serve others. A new commandment I give to you, Jesus said, to love one another as I have loved you. The Latin word for commandment is mandatum, which became mandi in English. This is why English-speaking countries call this day Maundy Thursday, and why churches may hold a foot washing ceremony on this day of Holy Week. Communion is often taken at Maundy Thursday services to commemorate the Holy Sacrament's foundation that occurred at Jesus' Last Supper. Maundy Thursday may be a time of somber reflection as we contemplate the Holy Week events to come. The day is also a time to remember Jesus' new commandment and to consider how we might show Christ's love to the world. The Lord calls us to this supper of remembrance. As we break the bread and share the cup, but we will never forget cross example. Good evening. Let's stand. Turn to page. Instead of 292, which is in the uh, bulletin, we're going to sing page 301, Jesus Keep Me Near the Cross, verses 1, 3, and 4. 1, 3, and 4. <clears throat> Jesus keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain Free to all a healing stream Flows from Calvary's mountain shall find rest beyond the river near the cross O Lamb of God bring it scenes before In the cross, 
Good evening, everyone. I would like to welcome you to our Monday Thursday service tonight and remind you of, of a few more things we have going on around the church this week, uh, leading all the way up to Easter and the resurrection. So tomorrow we will be back in here at 6.30 p.m. for our Good Friday service, and I hope that you will join us for that special uh, time of worship together. Along with that, tomorrow there will also be the blood drive from 1 p.m. to 6 p.m., and we will have a food truck, Hollywood Grill food truck, outside from 3 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. as well. So if you are planning to donate blood, you can get food. Or if you'd like to get food before the Good Friday service, you can do that as well. And that is open to anyone. And then finally, after tomorrow, uh, we get a day of rest, as it was a silent Saturday uh, a little over 2,000 years ago as well. And then we will be back in here uh, Sunday at 8.30 or in the gym and then 10.45 in here for Easter Resurrection Service. So if you will, please bow your heads with me. O merciful and gracious God, time after time you have saved your people from disaster. You have given us a feast to remember your mercy and to be incorporated into your salvation. We sing your unending praises. But we are always mindful that the reason you did these things for us is because we have fallen away from you. Human faithlessness caused the children of Israel to be taken into slavery, yet you delivered them from death. We too are enslaved by sin so that you had to send your only son, the perfect and spotless lamb, to die for us. By his death, we are rescued from everlasting condemnation. On this night, we are confronted with our sin. O oh God, take away the pain of its consequences and renew us by your forgiveness. We are made new by your Holy Spirit. Give us also a spirit of humility that we may follow the example of our blessed Savior who stooped to wash the feet of his disciples. Help us to reach out to those who are in need and to become their servants for your sake, fed on your word and sacrament, so that we too may feed others. Accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving as we proclaim to all the world the Lord's death until he comes again to take the whole world to himself. Empower us to love one another in the ways that we have been called to love. Be with us in all dark gardens of our lives and grant us the peace we need to accept your will in place of our own. Hear us, blessed Lord, 
For we pray in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. that drives me helplessly through flesh and would reveal a burn that burns much deeper
seem unclear, but it, my maker Good evening. Scripture tonight comes from the book of Luke, chapter 22, verses 14 through 23. When the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table. Jesus said, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. Then he said, Take this and share it among yourselves, for I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, This is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. But here at this table, sitting among us as a friend, is the man who will betray me. For it has been determined that the Son of Man must die. But what sorrow awaits the one who betrays them. The disciples began to ask each other which of them would ever do such a thing. The word of God for the people of God. Good evening. It's good to be with you on this night, but it is a somber night, isn't it? It's the first of two somber nights that we celebrate each and every uh, each and every Easter season during Lent, during the Holy Week. And as we continue through Holy Week, we've had a blessed journey so far, Monday night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night. We've had great speakers. We've learned a lot, had a great meal last night, and we remembered many of the things that the Jewish people, that the disciples with Jesus would be doing during this time. But we as Christians really need to always engage in this part of the week. Because as I've often said from any pulpit that I've had the privilege of standing in, we quite often show up on Palm Sunday and don't come back to Easter Sunday. We leave when it's joyous and we return when it's joyous. We forget what happened during the week. We forget the things and the places that Jesus went during the week. We forget the times that he was betrayed, denied, spit upon. And we need to remember those things and engage in them to truly understand what Easter really means. And that's why we're here tonight. Not to be somber for long. Because in just a couple of days, the tomb will be empty. But we should remember what Christ went through for us. As Jesus was approaching Good Friday, and we will have a wonderful service here tomorrow night. I'm very much looking forward to seeing <coughs> the vision that Elizabeth Crosby has. She's got something special in store for you. Come check it out tomorrow. We will have that moment in time. But Jesus would have been on his road to the... Good Friday and the cross on this night. And as he neared the end of his earthly journey in human form, knowing what awaited him, Christ continued to serve his disciples and those around him. He didn't just serve, he served in a powerful way. And on this night, he set the table for them, didn't he? And all who would follow them 
have found that table set. Jesus' act of service at the Lord's table wasn't even his first act of service that week. If you glance through some of the other Gospels, John 13 shows Jesus washing his disciples' feet. What a humbling act of servitude. Showing that I am with you, not looking down on you. That's what separated Jesus from so many of the leaders of the time. From so many of the gods they had been talked about. Was Jesus was among his people. Walking the roads with them. Understanding their lives. Not just looking down from above. And washing the feet was the truest show of humble service he could do. And it was in an ideal example for the life that we too should follow and live. Also in John, and I'll put this one on the screen for you. Chapter 13, verses 34 through 35, Jesus would continue in his act of servitude and asking us to follow in the ways that he lived by his example. Jesus never asked us to do something he also did not do and didn't live out that example. I've told this story before, but I always think of my Uncle Burley when I think of Jesus asking us to do this. I had, a, I had an uncle when I was growing up. He was a very inspirational person to me. And my Uncle Burley, you, you, you know he was... He's been gone for a few years now. We don't name folks Burley anymore. But Burley was one of the kindest, gentlest souls that I ever met. He and his wife, Kathleen, my aunt and uncle, did so much to point me to the Lord. But my Uncle Burley once got on to me because I had been in trouble at school. And I might have said a word in grammar school that I shouldn't have said. But instead of whipping me or... Even calling and telling mom, he, he made a challenge to me. And he said, I tell you what, if you never say a word that you don't hear me say, you'll be okay. He said a challenge that his example would lead. At his funeral, I approached my Aunt Kathy and I said, did he ever utter a word? Did he ever say a word he shouldn't have said? She said in our 60-something years of marriage, I heard it once. He was human, but just barely in that regard. He set an example, and he stood by it, and it was one that can change and was worthy of following. But even his could not compare to the life Jesus lived and the example that he leaves us. But because of Jesus, you can be like my Uncle Burley. You can live a life worth following. You can live a life that reflects our Savior. And Jesus sets that commandment in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples. There's the litmus test. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus continuing to set the table, to set the example for us to follow. He's setting both a spiritual table for us in communion, but also setting a table full of his examples and teachings on how to live even in the storms of life. You need to remember that Jesus is setting this table and saying these things and challenging them with this new commandment, still loving them in this way when he knew what awaited him in just hours. He still remained true. In our scripture tonight that we follow along, along in in Luke chapter 14, in, uh, sorry, Luke chapter 22 verse 14 says, When the hour came... And the disciples probably thought this is the hour they would celebrate the Passover. We remembered the Passover dinner last night. Many of you were here. Most of you enjoyed it, except Christina. She was very tired. But we're thankful for that sacrifice. And in those moments last night, we were remembering what they would have done. And it was supposed to be a festive time, a time of celebration, a time of children uh, searching for the Messiah that was to come. And, and we know that that's what they would have been expecting on this night was fellowship and celebration. But 
when the hour came, I don't believe the scripture was talking about the Passover dinner, which would have been set to begin at sundown. But it was referring to the hour of Jesus' arrest, of Jesus' mock trial, and Jesus' road to the cross. They wouldn't have known that, but Jesus did. And Jesus was still very much in this moment in human form. The scripture notes he was reclining at the table and in a position to eat. Now Jesus, if he wanted to, could have gone on and taken part in the Passover meal. He had the power of Satan in his temptation of Jesus, had already shown the things he could do by bringing it to light. By the way, Satan did not lie about that. Jesus had the power to do all of those things. But he chose a different path. And instead of taking part in the Passover, he continued on. And I want you to see his humanity still in this moment because verse 15, Jesus told them that he earnestly desired to eat the meal with them. Jesus wanted to remain with his friends. He wanted to be with them. He was not looking forward to the path that he had to walk. Matthew 27, 46 said, Jesus cried out to God, did he not? Was there another way? But Jesus knew there wasn't. So realize in this moment in time on the first, uh, on the first Monday Thursday at the Lord's table that he was fixing the set that Jesus could still have turned back. He had the ability, but he chose us again as he chose us every single time that he had an opportunity to do so. He chose to stay on the path despite his betrayer Judas sitting at the table. Jesus chose to continue on his path despite his denier Peter sitting at the table. Jesus chose to continue the path despite doubting Thomas who in a few short days would, deny, would, would doubt that he had all the abilities that he had claimed to have who was still sitting at the table. And on this night, I need you to know that Jesus stayed at the table. He stayed on the path despite of every shortcoming that you and I have ever had and could ever have. He remained on course. We know that Jesus knew this would be the last True Passover. They would wait for a Messiah no more because he had arrived. Jesus shifted the narrative of the Passover meal from focusing on the supper of lamb that represented a sacrifice to an actual remembrance in the Lord's Supper that he was going to serve as the lamb of sacrifice for us all. Everything is changing in this moment. Jesus knew what he was doing would richly symbolizing the giving of his body to create a permanent path to salvation for each of us that chose to take it. The disciples, still not understanding this, were probably perplexed in verse 16. As Jesus stated, I will not eat it again, speaking of this meal, speaking of the things before him. He would not eat it again until everything was fulfilled and he was in the kingdom. And this, apply, this implied that the hour was indeed upon them when Jesus would have to leave the form he had come to earth in. Tonight we reflect on that. On this night. So many Monday Thursdays have passed since then, but its meaning is as true and as sacred and as important tonight as it ever has been. What Jesus was about to do and put himself through was simply because we were on his mind. Jesus would take the cup and he would tell them to divide it among themselves. He then broke the bread and passed it to each of them and by doing these things, he showed that despite of their shortcomings, that they were still all welcome at the table. There was a peace for everyone. There was juice 
wine for everyone, representing his sacrifice. We should remember this night that we are all still charged with doing our part if we've called upon the name of Jesus to love our neighbors as the new commandment called us to do. And the reason we should do that is that so these elements before us can continue to be distributed to all who Christ died for. We have a solemn duty to reflect the very nature of our Savior in his acts, not just on this night, but on every day that he lived and hereafter. And when we reflect those things, this open table will have many more people who will venture to it. Verses 19 and 20, I'm going to read to you tonight again. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. We see this in this moment, and we know the sacrifice what it means, the disciples did not understand at the time the symbolism, but we do. John Wesley, the founder of the United Methodist Church, or Methodist teachings and Wesleyan teachings, had a quote where he said that participation in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper was central to Christian life and living. He insisted it's the duty of every Christian to receive the Lord's Supper as often as they can. Each time you should remember while you're at that table. And again, I'm going to read verse 20 one more time. This is why I believe John Wesley believed that. And after the cup and after they had eaten, Jesus said, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. As we hear that tonight, Wesley believed as I believe, that because of verse 20, Jesus knew he was becoming the new covenant. He was an update from Exodus uh, chapter 24, verse 8. A more complete way to the Father. And because of Christ's sacrifice, allowing his body to be the sacrificial atonement of our sins... Christians who on this night and on any day who have called on Jesus don't have to have Passover anymore as the Jewish people did. Because now, if you have been washed into the blood of Jesus, your sins have been passed over. Thanks be to God. Jesus goes on to point out that his betrayal was at the table that night. Yet he still served him, along with doubting Thomas and denying Peter. Why would Jesus do this? Why would he serve communion to them? Why would he wash their feet? Because he loved them. He knew their imperfections and he knows ours. I want you to think of the person that you're the angriest with tonight. Don't look to your left or right, please. <laughs> I want you to think of the person that has hurt you the most in this life. I know that's hard. We don't want to go to those places. But I want you to know that we had a Savior that was so loving that he would have washed their feet too. He would have served them at the table. Just like us. I don't care where you are politically. Jesus would bring Joe Biden and Donald Trump to the same table. Jesus would bring Vladimir Putin to the table with pastors and drug addicts and Osama bin Laden and Mother Teresa and any person from any end of the spectrum that you can believe in. He would bring them to the table together because that's what he died for. Each and every person, not just the ones that we choose. Not just the ones that we want to gravitate toward. Everyone was welcome. 
And on the very next day after this communion, the very next day after the Lord's Supper, I will tell you to prove that point one more time that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. There's no one that it can't reach if we allow it to. If you'll turn with me to page 12, we're going to do this a little bit different tonight. I'm going to consecrate the communion from a a service of word and table to... And you will repeat the the bolded parts with me. After that, we will have our final hymn. And if you need to come up and pray during that time, you can. But as soon as that hymn is over, I'm going to invite Elizabeth, Drew, and Sarah to come up here. And we are going to serve communion to whoever comes up, whoever desires it tonight. And then there will be no closing prayer That communion will be your dismissal. As you leave this place, I challenge you to reflect on it, to remember why it happened and what it meant and what it says about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ our Lord invites us To his table, all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. And we have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Forgive us for our joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Let us offer one another signs of reconciliation and peace. As forgiven and reconciled people, let us offer ourselves and our gifts to God. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ, by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection. You gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, And made us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread and gave thanks to you. Broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup and gave thanks to you. And gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant 
poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all us gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glories is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And as Jesus was with his disciples on that night, and they did not yet understand the things that were happening. He took the bread. And he said, this is my body. Broken for you. And he took the wine and he poured it. He said, this is my blood spilt for you. There was no little air stick beside it. It was for you. It was for all who have walked this earth. We have a choice to accept it and embrace it. And I pray on this night that you do. After the final song, when you come up, I always teach. It's a gift you can't take it, you accept it. You had no say in it, neither did the disciples, but Jesus did it. So when you come to accept that, you will be giving a small piece of bread tonight. And then you'll get a juice cup as well. We're, do, we're using real bread, folks. I'm, we're really excited. But in that way, when you come and take part tonight... I pray you leave this place remembering all the things that he did for us. The path that he remained on when he could have walked away. And then we'll return here tomorrow. One more somber day. One day of reflection on Saturday. And praise be to God. Sunday morning is not far away. There will also be a gluten free option up here if you need it. Let's stand once again, turn in your hymnals to page 131. We'll sing all three verses of We Gather Together, page 131. We gather together to ask the Lord's blessing. He chastens and hastens his will to make known the wicked oppressing now cease from distressing. Sing praises to his name. He forgets not his own. Beside us to guide us, our God with us joining, ordaining, maintaining his kingdom divine. So from the beginning, the fight we are winning. Thou, Lord, was at a sign 
All glory be thine. We all do extol thee, the leader triumphant, and pray that thou still our defender wilt be. Let thy congregation escape tribulation. Thy name be ever praised. O Lord, make us free. 